we were talking about John Griffith uh, and, and um, how he got interested in your work. How did you get interested in him as a person? Oh, well, you see, that, that work in time, a, a lot of collaboration. A lot of collaboration. You see, we, we published a paper together. That was a, 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 yes. at least one. I think there may have been two, but, but at least one paper. And, and, and what we, we did um, uh, was, I, 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 t taking forward this idea of how those two nerve cells interact with yes. each other electrically, um, because if you knew that, you could begin to understand the way networks of nerve cells interact. And it is indeed, it's a, a major tool in the neurophysiological analysis of ne neuronal systems in the brain. But I think ours may have been the first paper was published, I think it was. Um, and it, it, there was no mathematics available to study it, so he had to devise mathematical uh, tools that were for analysing it. Um, there were no computers in those days. You realise these are just electrical pulses, mm. uh, and um, uh, you, you couldn't uh, um, analyse the interval of time elapsing between each pulse in, 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 in those days. You had to film it on move cine, cine film, and have, I had miles of cine film records, and uh, I, I, uh, I took them across, and John and I would go across to the mathematics laboratory, and there was a woman there that was quite familiar with um, uh, measuring uh, signals on, on um, uh, cinemat cinematographic film, rolls of cinematographic film, and uh, some of those signals were pulsars. That, 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 yes. that was the work that was going on in Cambridge at, at the moment. In my room. Oh, was it? Mm, in the department. Oh, well, well it, that, that was, that, those, I, I saw some of those traces, they were just like our, well, my traces that came from the, from the cat's brain, these, these pulses that were coming. And so they said, yeah, they could do it, we would have to pay for it. And it was a, an, an extraordinary, uh, I won't go into the, it was a wonderful piece of apparatus that was used, it was such, such an old fashioned stuff <laughs> today. And it took months for this wonderful person to do all the measuring of the interval between each pulse and so on. And, uh, and we spent much time in, in, uh, in Kings uh, here. Or, or, see, by that time I became a fellow in 1962. Um, and uh, we spent much time uh, in my room. Uh, we spent much time in his room. Uh, we spent much time in my laboratory. And we formed a great friendship. Mm -hmm. And he, he used to come home a lot. And he was liked by him. He was liked by the children, and he was. He was a. He was, people had very peculiar views about John, uh, but he was an absolutely lovely person. And going beyond our own work together, he was a, a very, very original scientist, and I think would have got a Nobel Prize. Well, can we go on with your career? Because uh, I, I mean, you went to, off to Berkeley to to, to um, uh, work with Dick Hill. Yeah. Well, what was the place? That, well, how did this come about? Well, what happened? I'd come back with still um, working. I decided I was going to work on attention. I told you. I, I said that attention had these uh, experimental mm. components of, of, of competing stimuli. There's always going to be two stimuli mm. around where you're going yes. to be working with 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 with, with, uh, uh, with attention. And uh, <coughs> I had <have> found <coughs> some nerve cells in the visual part of the brain, the visual cortex, that responded, not, they responded to visual stimuli, but they also responded to, to tactile stimulation of the skin. Very few of them, responses were quite weak, but n people hated that. Mm. The visual physiologists mm. didn't mm. like it. There was a group in Germany led by Jung and uh, Baumgartner who had found similar things for auditory inputs, neurons in the visual cortex responding to clicks. Yes. And some even to vestibular stimulation. Um, but Dave Hubel and, uh, and uh, Vernon Mountcastle really didn't like that. Uh, they were very influential field figures at that time mm. uh, in the States. Um, but still, they were early days. Um, but they really didn't like it because it meant the visual system was being interfered with yes. by other stimuli. Right. And, and, and of course, that's a nuisance because you, you want to, uh, to process visual signals from the retina. Ideally, you want it uncontaminated by mm. anything else so you can do the analysis. Mm. And the contamination has come elsewhere. To get it contaminated from within the system is uh, is, a, is a nuisance. Mm. Uh, I don't know what the other explanations would be. So we people who me coming it f to it from attention, and then finding out that you would find nerve cells in the visual part of the brain that responded to a tactile stimulus, whether the animal was attending or not, 
There was a basic level of interaction going on mm. that was independent of whether the animal was switching attention. And Peter Venables and I did a, an experiment in humans, the counterpart of the experiment I've been doing on animals, which is very similar, showing that not only do you get switching between two what modalities like auditory and visual, but they inter actually interfere with each other in, an anal in the analysis. So they interfere with each other from our psychophysical data at quite a, l a low level, that's somewhere mm. possibly even the sensory processing system mm. from the retina to the brain, but we weren't sure. But certainly quite a low level of... of uh, in, in and there are efferent fibres going down there? Right? Well, there are efferent fibres, not to the retina in, in, uh, in mammal, there may be one or two, there are plenty of retina fibres going to the, the next station on, yeah, yes. and plenty of fibres that are not visual going up the visual cortex yeah. that had never, not really been discovered at that time, by the way, because that discovery depended upon showing an anatomical route, mm -hmm. and no one had except in 1963, Charles Shute and Peter Lewis in the Department of Anatomy, where I was working, you see, in Cambridge, they had shown there were pathways that had never been discovered uh, uh, that actually were not visual, but they went into the visual pathways mm. from other parts of the brain. Right. And I thought, well, there's the key. And I was sort of primed by this anatomical knowledge. Yeah. And I knew that the visual cortex and the next station down before the retina had these fibers going yes. into them, and it could be influenced. There was a system that was there. Well, well, I, 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 I thought, well, there was a lot of evidence that a lot, quite a lot of this extraordinary high level of brain function, that is attention switching, for example, and what one would call clinically consciousness, whether a person in coma or alert, is controlled deep down in the very primitive parts of the brain called the brain stem. It's common in all those parts. And I wanted to go, I'll, I'll tell you how I got to Berkeley, but I wanted to go and spend some time putting electrodes into that brain stem mm. and seeing whether there were indeed lots of, what can I say, polycentral neurons, nerve cells there that responded to more than one sensory modality, because mm. that's what, what I would mm. predict. And um, I had written, uh, possibly I thought one of the best chapters by myself in my life, um, when I came back, um, I wrote a, 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 a chapter called uh, Some Neural Correlates of Perception, which I buried in an obscure book. I'd been persuaded by John Lehern to, to contribute to this book, which I did, and I think no one ever read the book. Uh, but I gave it to Horace Barlow to read. And um, I think Horace was, well, liked it. I mean, he was quite he was very helpful over it. And in, in, uh, in the 60s, I was wanting to go somewhere on sabbatical leave. I've I, 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 um, <coughs> been working quite hard around here. Um, and I, I asked people around, and, and, and Horace said, well, look, uh, I've got, I, he was leaving Cambridge to take a chair in, um, in Berkeley. Yes. And he couldn't go that term. But there was a stipend available. So would you like to go? Uh, you, the money is there. You'd have to do the teaching. Well, that was all right because it was it was teaching on the physiology of vision. Mm. Um, so I went. That was how I came to go. I went on what was I, uh, it was a, a very grand title of a chair for a junior person, but it was basically Horace Barbier's chair. Um, and when I arrived at, at, at Berkeley, and I all intending to put a little microelectrode which could detect single nerve cells into the brain stem. I was told that I had to work with Dick Hill. <coughs> well, <laughs> it turns out there was not enough equipment for me to work by myself, you see, so, <coughs> so I had to work with Dick Hill, and, and, uh, and we had to work on, 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 on rabbits, which I didn't, didn't usually work with, anesthetized rabbits, and I didn't usually work with him. <coughs> but I said, okay, <coughs> we'll go down, we'll put an electrode down into this brain step. And we put the electrode in. This is, I do emphasize the animals anesthetized. And uh, lo and behold, we come across nerve cells that respond most beautifully to a s visual stimulus, very, very discreet visual stimulus. And I think I remember one day dropping a pin on the floor. I mean, actually just dropping a pin on the floor. 
and we were monitoring the activity of these nerve cells. You can hear them going on the on, on, on the loudspeaker, and they're 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 they're, they're doing their own muttering away without doing anything at all. So you could hear a neuron going pop 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 pop, and I remember dropping this pin on the floor, <laughs> and the nerve cell going brrp. It was absolutely amazing. It could have been vibration, of course, but it was you know it was only a very 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 <laughs> <efficient sound. laughs> And, and I was able to repeat it, so it's pretty clear the work. Mm. So that we then began to investigate substantial, and we found there were lots of nerve cells there responding to sounds very briskly, and nerve cells responding to touch from all over the body, mm. as well as to visual input. So it was amazing. But what was more amazing that we were not in the place I thought we were in. When we came to look <laughs> at where the electrode had been, it was not in the core of the brain stem. It was in the roof of the brain stem. But what was the roof? The roof of the brain stem is the most, most ancient visual center in vertebrates called the optic tectum. In, in mammal we call it superior colliculus. The optic tectum. Um, it, it, it's the basis of vision in a very large number of vertebrates. Mm. And all, well, when, when, we, when I couldn't believe this, but there was no doubt that electro was not deep down. It was, it was in this visual structure. And I, I, I found it very difficult to believe. So we looked through the literature, and there was nothing published in the literature about what the nerve cell responses were, whether they responded. There was, there was nothing really, just some very general stuff on visual responses. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, of course, <coughs> the world didn't believe us. Mm -hmm. they, I remember going back to Cambridge and telling Dixon Boyd, the professor of anatomy, mm -hmm. that, that and he, so he knew the superior colliculus from anatomy, and I said. Well, there are cells there that respond to sound and to touch as well as light. And he said, I come from Boston, he said. And I said, what does that mean? He said, prove it. <laughs> <laughs> Which I was easily able to do by showing him the record, you see. So that was, th then a lot of people jumped in on that. And there's a lot of work still going, in on, going on uh, about mm. the superior colliculus. Um, but then I was also found that neurons in that part of the brain did something very remarkable. Um, because watching the oscilloscope screen the, and, and listening to the nerve cells firing, you'd, you'd, one moment you'd hear a nerve cell responding beautifully to a, uh, a visual stimulus mood across the field of vision. And then you do it again, it doesn't respond. And I, I really, we couldn't understand what, this was, what was going on. And I remember sitting down one day and looking at the oscilloscope screen, puzzling about this, and then realizing that what we were doing was in the, if you gave these stimuli very infrequently the neuron responded each time if you gave it a little more frequently slowly the neuron stopped responding if you gave it too frequently it just didn't respond it, in other words it was it was showing what was called habituation which had been observed in behavior mm -hmm. and which i'd been privileged to hear about especially from bill thorpe in his very important Thorpe Zangwill Club, which I ought to talk about, but um, held in Jesus, where you mm. went to as well. Um, and I learned about habituation then in animals, yes. which is they give a response to novel stimulus, and if the novel sti that stimulus isn't rewarding, not, gonna, not food or cold or shelter or, or, or not a mate, they st the animal will stop. So that was the beginning of your work on habituation. Your, yeah. That was when I suddenly realized we're dealing with a nerve neural counterpart to behavioural yes. habituation. So I saw my life, well I saw retrospectively, my life opening up in two directions. Yes. I saw that I really must follow this elementary form of learning because here was a clue to beginning to understand the, yes. uh, uh, the, what the neural base of that learning might be. And the other one was of course sensory interaction. So years later on the sensory inter interaction side, 1967-68, um, Dick Hill wrote to me and said he'd like to come and spend a summer in Cambridge. And I'd still got money from NIH, the Tommy mm. Uh as I recall. I think I have still. Um, and I read about this vestibular neurons and visual cortex responding to vestibular stimuli. And I'd already been to, to, uh, to McElroy to work with my friend uh, and colleague, and our friend and colleague, mm. Hugh Fraser-Rao. And there, 
and I, I'll explain uh, as well another segment of this. I worked on locust brain, yes. and I'd yes. never, you see, I was a medical background. I never thought of invertebrates. Never. I mean, I never thought of them. Uh, I, I was oriented to humans, oriented to mammals, yes. uh, but really below mammals, it wasn't. It didn't enter into my province really of, of thinking, and it, uh, and um, and Hugh, and not until I came to Cambridge, by the way, that was the beginning of the opening of the eyes, really. But I, I began to work on uh, on the locust, and I got to know some literature about invertebrates, and I came across a work by and met him, a man called Wiesma. Mm -hmm. Wiesma was a Dutch uh, um, origin, and he was working at. Um, Caltech. Mm. On crayfish. On crayfish. Yes. And he was recording from nerve cells, nerve fibres and the optic nerve of the crayfish. And he found that these nerve, he could, it were, he could show by listening into this nerve fibre in the optic nerve. This nerve fibre was looking at the field of vision above the horizon. So that was fine. Every time you gave a visual stimulus down here, the nerve cell did not show any response. If you gave a visual stimulus up here or up here, it did. But what he found though, that if he, he tilted the animal in his little chamber, that nerve cell ought to have, it ought to have responded, not over here, it ought to have responded over here, if he tilted the animal that way. But the nerve cell didn't. The nerve cell went on responding in the same area of space. I think he might have called them space constants in Europe, I'm not sure. But I had come across this and you know, I, I said to, to Dick, well, why don't we see if something like this exists in the visual cortex mm. of a mammal? Well, that was the beginning of the story and, and, and indeed we found it was so and, and we sent off a letter to Nature and that was published <coughs> um, very, very hot controversy about that. Yes, Intense controversy. And the following year, uh, I was I was joined by Jerry Steckler, and we spent a year working on this once again. Mm. And we published the full paper in 1972. Mm. And and the vitriol that was heaped upon me, I felt, was so great that going to meetings anywhere in the world uh, in in the visual forum, mm. the hostility to the notion that the visual system could uh, have another input and effective transmission of signals was. I never really understood it. I, I genuinely, coming from my background in anatomy, <coughs> where you had a knew there were these other mm -hmm. fibers going there. And what's more, you'll be quite interested to know that that uh, in, in recent years, you know, I said there's this somatic sensory mm -hmm. input to the visual cortex, that I found, and auditory. Well, there's been some work done in the States particularly showing that in people born blind, the visual part of the brain responds to touch. And of course, I, my first reaction yes, well, the substrate is there. I mean, uh, yes. it, yeah, maybe I'm still wrong, but the point was that it took many years for other people to confirm this. I mean, it was a difficult experiment to do, by the way. Yes. And it also took courage for people to do it in the States. And there was a group in the States, I think the author was Frost, I it was in published paper in 1981, saying, in a sense, that I was wrong in the fact that I underestimated the number of these there were more than I had suggested there were. But, but it still went dead and, and um, it still, it's still frowned on. I don't, I, it's a, an amazing uh, lacuna, it seems to me, in the scientific system that this still isn't quite respectable. I'll tell you why. And that's because I, I, people who are trained in a certain kind of science do an experiment where you vary one thing and keep everything else constant. And if you get an effect, that's the cause. And, and, and you know, I mean, people still think in this very linear way. And, 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 and so if, if somebody like you comes along and says, it's not the cause, it's one of the causes. And, 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 and people hate this kind of the systems approach to, to, to biology. And I, I, I encounter many physiologists who hate this. And, and, and it just sort of, you really hit them below the belt, as it were. I mean, they, well, I, I, yeah. I, I, as I remember, uh, yeah. uh, I had some interaction uh, with, with Colin Blakemore about this, uh, very friendly, he'd gone to Oxford and, um, uh, and, and he said, well the, the trouble is we physiologists don't know to handle, how to handle parallel systems or interacting systems. That's right. And it's, therefore it's not popular. 
Mm. Uh, I don't know, that's it. I don't know the explanation for mm. it. But it's, uh, I, indeed, I, I read a review uh, published a few years ago, about three or four years ago, by someone in Stirling University about this kind of influence, and she had never heard of this earlier work. And I wrote to her, and she said uh, she, she was very pleased to know about it, but she'd been facing terrible troubles getting her work published still. <laughs> So that was how that yes, uh, yes. came, and uh, I felt then the quicker I get out of the field of visual physiology, yes. the better I should, better I should be, the happier I should be, and, and uh, the more interesting are other fields. It was a vicious field. And that was about the time that you and I started. To We'd already started. You see, yes. you and I had started. You and I had started in nineteen. Before you went to McGarry, I think we, right. we started talking about it. That's right. That's right. And and then when I came back, mm -hmm. we began to uh, think of ways of. of dealing with that problem. Um, uh, and as I, I gradually moved into that field, and you're slowly moving from habituation, slowly moving from. But on the habituation front, of course, that's, in a sense, it's, it's, it's the story there, if you want to hear it, I don't know whether you do it. Mm. Um, because uh, I went on to study it in, in the insect brain and, and, and work out its characteristics. And <coughs> a year after I'd uh, Dick Hill and I had published in Nature, showing these lovely habituating curves of mm. neurons and showing that these nerve cells had so many of the properties of behaviour. Um, um, a paper appeared in 1965, I was in 64, from Tauk and Brunner in, in France, showing that you, got, you, you could get this kind of response decrement and showing many of the properties of behavioural habituation mm. across a single junction between yes. nerve cells and the next no, no, neuron. And the trouble was, they didn't know it was any one nerve cell to the next nerve cell. They, they, they could have been many nerve cells interacting, mm. and they hadn't got a system that did it. And I thought, well, I need a system to do that. Mm. And so I, I knew there was one system where there was unequivocally the case that one nerve cell uh, send a signal to another nerve cell, right. synapsing with another nerve cell. And that was the squid giant ganglion. There was a, the squid has a huge nerve fibre which has been of immense use in physiology and also that junction has been used extensively for physiological studies. And I thought that is the place, if I can show this habituation, then I know it's habitual, it's, it's a moss, yes, it's yes. occurring within the synapse and you've got to look within the synapse to understand mm -hmm. it. You don't need to look much further. And indeed, it, 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 it happened, uh, and I remember um, giving a, a presentation of these results uh, to that conference that uh, Robert Hind and I had organised, Short Term Change in Neural Activity, in 1969. Yes. And uh, um, uh, um, uh, Eric Candle was, was there, he, um, and I showed these slides of these this lovely waning of a response, and it had to, the responsibility had to be on the presynaptic side, not the postsynaptic side. And it could happen at a monosynaptic junction. And I said I thought that calcium was probably involved, but it could be other things. But Well, Candell showed later on that calcium was involved, it did happen at a monosynaptic junction, but he never referred to that work. <laughs> <laughs> Except after he got his Nobel Prize. <laughs> he told me, well, I bumped into him in London, and, I, uh, and he turned around, and I hadn't seen him for years, and he recognised me instantly, and he, the first thing he said to me was, Gabriel, he said, putting his arm around me, that was a great paper you published on the squid stone, Stella Gangel. And I thought, how could he suddenly bring this to the top of his head, never <laughs> having mentioned it once? <laughs> <laughs> well, we know. <laughs> We've interfered with his whole game. But Anyway, um, well, I suggest that we, we that, uh, I think our collaborative work we can, we, we can leave to later, but, yes. but, but, but um, going now to when you, you, you left Cambridge to go to Bristol, how, how were you approached by Bristol? Uh, oh, I wasn't approached. No, 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 it wasn't approached. What happened? I, I, um, I've been uh, in, 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 in the Department of Anatomy here in Cambridge for 18 years. Uh, before I left Bristol. And uh, I really wasn't interested in running anything except my, my research, doing my research. Uh, and and, and I, I'd been pulled onto the odd research committee and I didn't want to go, but Robert 
said, you've got, to, you've got to go, you've got a responsibility to conduct your research and you've got a larger responsibility to the sort of community at large, you know, rather. So, sure. so I thought, well, he's true. And that yeah. been, actually was a very important yes. uh, uh, um, piece of advice, in fact. Uh, so I joined that. Um, then I began to see that the way the university was running was important for my research as well. So I began to look a bit beyond my research. And I was teaching six hours uh, a week and had been for years and years and years here in King's. <coughs> And I'd been appointed reader, and and I was doing something on faculty board, just beginning. And I would sometimes go to my professor, uh, who was then head of the department, of course, and suggest things. And he had the reputation of doing whatever was the last person said to him before having to take the action. <laughs> and I didn't think that was a way to run a department. And mm -hmm. I had ideas for anatomy. And, uh, was that Harrison? It was Harrison. Yeah. Harrison. He was a lovely man, but he just didn't want to be bothered, actually, yeah. you know. Um, and I had, I'm going on holiday with a family. We used to go to, to Cornwall and Devon. We used to drive through Bristol. And I, I really loved Bristol. I loved the mm. Avon Gorge. And I used to love, I went to Cheddar when I was a little child. And I, it was my first outing into the countryside. And I loved the gorge. Mm. So when the chair of anatomy came up, of Bristol, I applied. I mean, I, I just yeah. actually I applied to a couple of other places at the same time, but but um, I turned them down because I I, I went to Bristol and they, they just yes. gave me the job, which was um, which was wonderful actually. Mm. So I actually I did apply. Yeah, yes, yeah, okay. But, but when you arrived in Bristol, I, I mean, I, I remember you made a lot of changes. I mean, it was it, it, it was it became a very sort of vibrant department. Yeah, I think I was I was extremely lucky in I was extremely lucky in that Barry Cross. Um, who had been in the Department of Anatomy in Cambridge, a veterinary anatomist, um, and a good neuroendocrinologist, and also a recorder, microelectrode recorder, mm. as it were, as I was, uh, and not your traditional anatomist, because traditional anatomist was really stuck to the microscope. Um, and um, he had done an extremely good job uh, in, in organising that department. And he had uh, uh, allowed... Um, uh, a young uh, um, junior lecturer um, to revise the teaching of topographical anatomy. So it was going extremely well when I arrived and I looked around, I looked at the teaching, I asked the surgeons whether they were satisfied um, uh, and the teaching looked as though it was good. So I was able then to concentrate on research and I, I been trying to think of what did I really do. I never felt I did anything actually, but I, on reflection, what I did was this. I, I always had a love of developmental biology. I always had a love of embryology. It seemed to me that going from a fertilised ovum to a newborn baby or whatever the species may be was just an incredible, incredible achievement. Uh, you know, if I use the word magical, I only mean the sense it's it is. It's a, it's a, it must be a very beautiful thing, that which underlies this process, that can do this. Mm. Um, and uh, the, the field of molecular uh, developmental biology was just beginning. And I had a vacancy in the Department of Anatomy. And I managed to get a very bright young man called John Noland. John Noland was working with Fred Sanger at the MRC laboratories here in Cambridge. <clears throat> and clearly he was ready to go somewhere. I don't know how I got to know of him. Somehow I got to know of him. And he came and began a sort of molecular developmental biology. Now the sad thing was that, that he, he only stayed for a short time. I think he left around about the time I left to come back to Cambridge. Um, uh, but but the, the problem was, you see, that I, I also felt that if I'm going to populate a department of anatomy with scientists, who have no medical training, then they ought to know at least a bit about anatomy. Mm. I, I still think that's the case, um, because medical students do need... Anatomy is very deadly dull topographical anatomy, unless it's inspired by what it means for the patient. Yes. Mm. And to have a clinical input seemed to me to be important. And I thought I could get John Nolan to get familiar with these things. But he, it was a big job for him to do, and I think that was too much for him to do. So. He and then and he helped it out, but I got that going, and um, uh, I of course brought in quite a lot of neuroscience mm. into the department, 
I encouraged oh, I encouraged the development of biomechanics. I had a, a, a very abrasive young man that was on the verge of going called Lance Lanyon, and uh, he was a very difficult chap. <laughs> But, but I managed to, I gave him, I had plen plenty of money to give, you know, as head of the department I could encourage people, and I gave him quite a lot of money mm. to encourage him to do his research. He got grants and built himself up, and he went on from strength to strength, so that was, became very strong. Um, we also became quite strong in oral biology, though a man called Bernie Moxon was doing a PhD, I appointed him. Um, so it was really a question of appointing the right people to mm. jobs mm. and encouraging them, and I think the other thing was, Yes, I, the other thing I think was that I was, as head of department, I did research. Mm. And I, I really felt that no head of a science department should be here unless they're doing research. Mm. That they mustn't just be a manager. They've got to lead in, in, in all things, in teaching, in research, and, and of course in, in managing administration as yes. well. But to give up on research can only bring about people despising you. Mm. So I was determined to stick with research, of course. Um, and um, the other thing was that there was some money in the Department of Anatomy that was called the Head of Department's Discretionary Fund. Who knows where the money came from? <laughs> well wishes for, the, for anatomical sciences. Yeah. Very small sums of money were donated. Fifty pounds here, yeah. and five pounds there. <coughs> now fifty pounds would in those days, would buy you nothing now. You would buy you next to nothing in those days. But one thing it bought me was the opportunity to bind the people in the laboratory together. And so I used to spend that money, or some of that money, on a party which I have for mm. a wine and cheese party once or twice a term for the, all the staff, mm. the technical staff, secretarial staff, the academic staff, and their partners. And uh, um, it, 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 that, that, went, that went very well. It was enjoyed by everybody. I didn't know whether it would be enjoyed by any, everybody, but it was enjoyed by everybody. And I have been back and met one or two people who are still around there, and they tell me that technicians particularly, who are coming close to retirement now, how, what, what wonderful days they were. Mm. So I think that was in part. And the other thing, it was two of those people that, that, that I appointed. One was Malcolm Brown, who yeah. became fellow of the Royal Society, remained in Bristol. Uh, a man called Bernie Moxham, oral biologist, went to become head of the Department of Anatomy at Cardiff. And both those two departments at the last research assessment exercise got five stars. And they were the only two departments of anatomy in the country that got five stars. Mm -hmm. So I, I, really, I was really very <laughs> pleased. I, you know, it, it is really, I think, having the good fortune to find good people at the right time and encouraging them. But I, when I used to come down and visit you, because we were, we were collaborating a lot then, yes. um, I always sort of felt that there was a lovely atmosphere about that department. Uh, well, there was. Uh, there, there was. It was. A, I felt it was a wonderful atmosphere. Yeah. I loved the place. And I, you know, I, when I was working in the laboratory, I used to walk around in stocking feet. It wasn't deliberate, but the point was, was sitting around in a darkened room working with, with, uh, yes. with recording for long hours with Malcolm Brown in those days was quite tiring. And, and I often keep my feet, you know, shoes off. And so I, if I was urgently called, I would walk around the corridors in, in stocking feet. <laughs> <laughs> So, yes, yeah, so it was with neuroscience, bio biomechanics, um, developmental biology, and and I think research in general, yeah. really, really putting a lot of effort yes. to encourage research. And then, as you remember, I mean, the Cambridge Zoology Department was having great problems in finding a new professor of, of, of zoology, uh, and talk of us had committed suicide, and Donald Parry was kind of holding the fort. And they put various people, and, that, and for various reasons, they all backed off. And then I, I, th I think I and possibly Robert contacted you and said, "Why, <laughs> why did you apply?" Well, I remember, I remember, I remember the telephone conversation with, with Robert because my wife and I, we had a lovely house in in in, 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 in um, a Georgian house in, um, in Clifton, in it? Clifton, yes. uh, Canning Square, absolutely lovely. And uh, the living room was upstairs, and um, the telephone the telephone was in another room, I think. Anyway, the phone rang, and, and my wife Prill and I were, 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 were chatting in, 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 in the living room, and the uh, phone rang, and I went to answer it, and it was Robert Hind. And he came up with this, what I thought was a ridiculous suggestion. And, and I said, but that's utterly absurd. You know, I'm not a zoologist. I have no real interest in, in natural history. 
and my knowledge of biology is very limited. And I gave all the reasons why I shouldn't. And he said, but you've worked on the squid, you worked on the locust, you worked on all sorts of animals, you even worked on human, you know, we'll forgive you for that. <laughs> um, so, so there was this long discussion, I think it lasted about an hour. And uh, I, I was quite certain that it was a ridiculous idea. I mean, it was genuinely, I mean, I, I, this was not prevarication. Mm -hmm. I thought it was genuinely ridiculous. I had the... <coughs> the highest <coughs> possible esteem for the Department of Zoology from my days in anatomy, where I had close links with zoology. Yes. Um, uh, but the people in the zoology department were, were, I thought, brilliant. I mean, amazing people were in, zoo in zoology. And to be asked to become the head of that department was, was, was utterly absurd, besides which of the other reasons. And in the end, I remember saying to Rob, well, if you want me or want my name to go forward, you can put it forward, I can hardly stop you, which wasn't quite true, of course. <laughs> uh, um, uh, but that was how it was left. Yes. And I came back into the room and spoke to Brother Button, and I said, this Bob has come up with this ridiculous idea. And I can't remember what happened after that, but um, <clears throat> finally I was offered the chair. And it was far from clear that I should take it. Had you been for interview or not? No. Mm. It was far from clear that I, I mean, I mean, I mean, you were well known in the department because you run the, 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 the neurosciences club, hadn't you? I mean, oh, I was well known in the department in yeah. that, that yeah. I had had a lot of interaction yes. with uh, the neuroscientists and the behavioural people. Yes. Through you in behaviour and yes. through John Traherne in the neurosciences. So and I was, Lisman, I was there, right? and Hans Lisman. I was there yeah. a lot. Amazing for an anatomist to be in zoology. It was, yeah. I think, very unusual. Yeah. Although, of course, zoologists start, anatomists started from zoology, didn't they? Or, no, it was the reverse way around, I think. Anyway, they originally were very close together those departments. But no, I mean, zoologists never, anatomists never ventured into no. zoology. And not, no hostility, it was just, and the converse never happened. But I did, and I think in part it was because my research was not, this was one of the attractions. Mm. My research cut across boundaries. Mm. And the one thing I saw as a positive in going to zoology was the fights that I continually had to mount in the medical faculty mm. and on the science faculty in Bristol about who was trespassing on what, whose territory, mm. what was neuroanatomy and what was neurophysiology, where did one begin and when did one end? And to me they were utterly senseless arguments. I didn't see the world that way and to be forced to teach students that way was anathema to me. Mm. I then got the reputation in Bristol for wanting to take over the physiology department, which was the last thing on my mind. I kind of think <laughs> how they thought that, but that was the reputation I now I, I came to have. Never crossed my mind. Mm. But the attraction of zoology in my discussions with you and with Robert, and I think those are the only two really, was the awareness, and I had discovered when I had been going there, it didn't matter whether you worked on behaviour or whether you worked on cells or parts of cells. It was all one. It was zoology. Zoology cut across everything to do with animals, and mm. animals included humans. That was a big plus. Mm. But it was still very far from clear because uh, the Department of Zoology was not in the best state. It had been an no. unhappy place because of the appalling history of, uh, of Torquil. Mm. Uh, and I think people were uh, feeling low, and must have been feeling low. And, um, uh, and to. I knew it would be an uphill task, but everything in Bristol was simply wonderful, and I loved being in yes, Bristol. Yes. And I, I remember going away with all the children in Prill to a holiday yes. in, in, in Wales, Tim Clutton Brock's place, I think, yes. the, near there. And, um, and we discussed it, we discussed it endlessly. And in the end, they said, well, Pa, or, well, Gabriel, it's up to you, you decide. We'll do whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. and so I, on the basis of this challenge, I suddenly thought, at well, the end of these deliberations, as it were, these self doubts, what an opportunity to abandon all these constraints and step into the wide world of real biology. Mm. Um, and and that, that, that's how, so I said, yes, I'll do that. So that's how that happened. It was a very peculiar experience, very totally unexpected. Yes.